Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. I had someone ask the question recently, how do I determine the characteristic impedance of an unknown piece of coax? Well, the immediate thought came to mind of how we used to do this thing using time domain reflectometry. All I needed was an oscilloscope, a square wave generator, a trimmer resistor, a fixed value resistor, and a small capacitor. But in the advent of the very affordable VNAs like the Nano VNA and the Mini VNA Tiny, this process becomes much easier to do. In fact, there are two different methods that we can use to make this measurement using your Nano VNA. In this video, I'm going to show you all three methods, starting with the two VNA methods. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Now, let's go to our VNA. The first thing that we have to do is figure out what frequencies we are going to be working with. Regardless of which of the two VNA methods you use, you will need to be aware of the frequency at which your coax is one quarter wavelength long. In the first method, we will be making the measurement at that frequency. In the second method, we will be avoiding this frequency in our measurement. We need to know two frequencies. We need to know the start and the stop frequencies for our VNA sweeps. To achieve this, we need to know the velocity factor of the coax in question. Being that this is an unknown piece of coax, probably unmarked, you may not actually know what that is. But you can measure it for yourself using one of the methods that I outline in my series on the subject. I've put a link to the first video in that series up in the corner for you. We also need to know the physical length of the coax. Well, that means that if it's in a reel, you might have to estimate the length. So the start frequency can be found by the speed of light times the velocity factor times 0.1, all divided by the physical length. The stop frequency is the speed of light times the velocity factor times 0.5, all divided by the physical length. Where the units used for the speed of light will reflect the units used to measure the length of your coax. I put the values of the speed of light in mega inches per second and mega centimeters per second in the description for you. For this demonstration, the unknown coax that I'm going to be measuring is 202 inches or 513.1 centimeters long. I've measured the velocity factor at 0.66. And being that I've measured my coax in inches, I will use 11,802.85 mega inches per second for my speed of light. Doing the math, this gives me a start frequency of 3.856 megahertz. I'll use 3.5 megahertz. I get a stop frequency of 19.281 megahertz. I will use 20 megahertz. In each case, we will be measuring the impedance of the coax as seen from the VNA. This means that you will need to carefully calibrate your VNA before you begin the measurement process. If adapters are needed to connect your feed line to the VNA, you might have to apply a port extension to the port of the VNA depending upon the frequencies that you're dealing with. I have also enabled a marker to use for our measurement. Lastly, I have set up the Smith chart as our display on the VNA. With my start and stop frequencies set and the VNA calibrated, we are ready to dive into measuring the characteristic impedance of our unknown coax. The first and probably the easiest way to make this measurement is what I call the quarter wavelength method. This method takes advantage of the impedance transformation characteristics of a quarter wavelength piece of coax. So let's do this. Step, Step one. one. Of course, it just makes sense that the first thing that we have to do is connect the coax to the VNA. Step, Step two. two. In preparation for the measurement, we terminate the other end of our unknown coax with a 50 ohm load. 
Step, Step three. three. We have to sweep the coax with the VNA to gather values. Now we move the marker to the first spot where the reactive value of the measured impedance reads as close to zero as possible or the S11 phase is zero. We are looking to be as close to that crossing point as we possibly can. Once this is accomplished, we read the R value of the reported impedance and we note this value. In this particular case, it turns out to be 112 ohms. Step, Step four. four. Now we get to calculate the characteristic impedance of our coax. We use the following formula. The characteristic impedance equals the square root of the resistance that we just measured times 50. We measured this R value as 112 ohms. So we have the square root of 112 times 50. So our characteristic impedance of our coax comes out to be 74.83 ohms. Now, how does the alternate VNA method work? In the place of ease of measurement, this one isn't too far behind the quarter wavelength method that we just got done showing you. We must make this measurement at some frequency well below or above the frequency where the coax is one quarter wavelength long. I will do it here below the one quarter wavelength frequency. This will be easily discernible when we look at the display of the VNA. Now I'm assuming at this point that the start and the stop frequencies have been set on the VNA and the VNA is completely calibrated. Step, Step one. one. Of course, it just makes sense that the first thing that we have to do is connect the coax to the VNA. Step, Step two. two. In preparation for the first measurement, we leave the other end of the coax open or unterminated. Step, Step three. three. We perform a sweep on the attached coax with the VNA. And then we move the marker to where we are in the vicinity of the minus 90 degree mark on our Smith chart you can also look at the S11 phase number in the marker values. We will be reading the capacitance or capacitive reactance of the coax at this point. We want to note this value. Now, in our case, I see 535.73 picofarads. Step, Step four. four. Now we will install a dead short on the end of the coax. We will perform a new sweep on the coax. And without moving our marker, we're going to read the new value. We will be reading the inductance or the inductive reactance of the coax at this point. We want to note this value. In our case, we see 3.032 microhenries. Step, Step five. five. Now comes the moment of truth. We get to do some mathematical magic to yield the characteristic impedance of our coax. We use the formula, the characteristic impedance is equal to the square root of the inductance divided by the capacitance. Now I had noted the inductance as 3.032 microhenries and the capacitance as 535.73 picofarads. This gives me a characteristic impedance of 75.23 ohms for this coax. Comparing this to our previously determined value, the difference between the two is a mere 0.53%. Now, let's see how to do this if we don't have a VNA. In eons past, my brother worked for the New York State Fairgrounds cutting grass. He and his co-workers decided one day that they wanted to dress up their title a little bit to make it sound more respectable than just grass mowers. They decided on vegetation height control technicians, a very impressive name for a relatively simple occupation. In the same sense, don't let the name time domain reflectometry scare you. 
All we're saying is that we dump a short pulse into the end of a transmission line. It runs down the transmission line at some speed determined by the velocity factor of the transmission line. It gets reflected back from the end and arrives some measurable time later back at the source. Measuring the time it takes for it to go up and back allows us to determine the velocity factor of a transmission line. You can see that done in my video on the subject. As always, there's a link up in the corner for you. You can use this same method to figure out where a fault is in a transmission line. Some percentage of this pulse will be reflected back from a fault, a change in impedance in the transmission line. If the transmission line is properly terminated, then the only reflection that you will see is the one at the fault. Knowing the velocity factor of the coax, you then can calculate the physical distance to the fault. Here, we're going to be using this property to measure the characteristic impedance of our unknown coax. This method even works with cable-like twisted pair data cable, which is the first place that I ever used it. If the termination resistance at the end of the coax matches the characteristic impedance of the coax, then there won't be any reflected pulse to be seen at the source. So, let's go see how this is done. First, we're going to need a very short pulse to send down that transmission line. We can create our own pulse easily enough using a small capacitor, a fixed value resistor, and a square wave generator. Here's my setup. I have a 7.5 picofarad capacitor in series with the signal coming from the signal generator and a 47 ohm resistor in parallel with the input to the oscilloscope. I set my square wave generator to output an 80 kilohertz square wave at 5 volts peak to peak. My scope is set to display 10 nanoseconds per division. The transmission line is connected in parallel with the scope. The overall schematic looks like this. Here you can see the signal generator, the series capacitor, the parallel resistor. You can see the scope connected in parallel with the coax. And then the other end of the coax terminated in a variable resistor. And here's my actual setup in the lab. Look at the scope. We see the incident pulse, which is this big one here. My coax is presently totally unterminated. Notice the really big positive pulse here. This is the one being reflected back from the end of the coax. We know the impedance is high because the reflected pulse is positive. Now watch when I short the end of the coax. Notice that now we have a very large negative pulse. This is because the terminating resistance is lower than the characteristic impedance of the coax. Now in preparation for our actual measurement, I need to construct a means of terminating my coax with some variable resistance. And so I've created this termination jig, which is just a multi-turn 500 ohm trimmer resistor mounted on a UHF female or SO239 connector. I will terminate my coax with this jig. Now we can measure the characteristic impedance of our coax. Looking at the scope display, we can see that the returning or reflected pulse is quite positive. This tells me that my termination resistor value is higher than the characteristic impedance of the coax. I will adjust my termination jig until I can totally eliminate the return or reflected pulse. Now that I've accomplished that, we remove the termination jig from the end of the coax and we measure its value using a DVM. We start by shorting our DVM's leads together to determine the dead short reading. We will subtract this off of the measured value of our jig. I have a shorted value of 0 0.1 ohms. Now we measure the value of our termination jig. It measures 74.4 ohms. We subtract our shorted measurement from our jig measurement to get the actual characteristic impedance of our unknown coax. This comes out to be 74.3 ohms. 
So how does this compare to our VNA results? So let's see what we got with each of these methods. With VNA Way 1, we got 74.83 ohms. With VNA Way 2, we got 75.23 ohms. And finally, with the TDR method, we got 74.3 ohms. These look all pretty close to each other, but let's put some real numbers to it. Worst case difference between any two values was 1.24%. This was between VNA Way 2 and the TDR method. The average difference was 0.62%. Based on this, I think we can absolutely believe what we measured within a reasonable amount of confidence. Now you know how to find out what the characteristic impedance of that roll of nondescript coax that you have laying around is. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.